So there's a couple laws. There's the law of polarity and the law or law of conservation of energy. Essentially, what that means is everything is always balanced. Good, bad, positive, negative, hot, cold, up, down are all always there. They're all relative. What our minds do is, is assign a positive or a negative polarity to them and neglect to see the other side. So it's like being in a relationship that you're super infatuated with. Oh, there's, they're only perfect. They're super hot. They're super nice. And it's, everything's perfect. You don't see the other side that also exists. And then all of a sudden they do some fucky shit and they go crazy and you go, Oh man, I was blindsided by that. You were because you were blind to the other side. You didn't take into account they're equally as many negatives to this person as there are positives. Welcome to the Viral by Design podcast with Dave Rothero, where we get inside the minds of today's leading viral marketers as they reveal the exact strategies they use to build brands, products, and campaigns that are magnetic to customers, spread like wildfire, and seize the attention of millions. This is Viral by Design. Viral by Design. So welcome to another episode of Viral by Design. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by John Whiten. After selling his marketing agency back in 2019, along with its 400 clients and 19 employees, John has helped over 2,000 students to implement the same life-changing strategies that he used throughout the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Program. He's been featured in MSNBC, Fox News, New York Times Weekly, Yahoo Finance, and Thrive Global Today. We're going to be discussing strategies that John now teaches his students to overcome mental blocks, to get out of their own way, to make their first million in business, and to unlock the full potential of our minds. So, John, thank you so much for joining us, first off. Yo, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. What an intro. Love it. That's actually me. Believe it or not. Love right, it. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure, man. So, hey, I'm really interested, first of all, to hear about that agency that you grew to 400 clients and 19 employees. So do you mind just giving us a bit, the quick kind of um, backstory on, on how I came about? Yeah. So the shortish version is uh, back in, I guess, 2016, 2017, when everyone was kind of doing the Ty Lopez SMMA transition into that business model. Um, I was kind of long story short, coming out of a whole bunch of failed other stuff that I was doing in business or trying to do. And um, a lot of things kind of clicked at once. Again, long story short. And um, we figured some stuff out in specifically the business to business lead gen space when um, before LinkedIn was kind of had any restrictions. Um, We capitalized on that quite well. And um, we used a very, very simple LinkedIn strategy that I pretty much doesn't work anymore because I think we almost single-handedly broke LinkedIn uh, during 2017, 2018. But essentially, it was uh, it was pretty. I don't say it was pretty easy, but like we had um, before LinkedIn automation was cracked down on, and there was any restrictions, we basically like had an enormous volume of automations that uh, were basically not restricted against. Long story short, that was the well, you need to not- pretty much the strategy. We just, you might say in so many words, we've been accused of spamming literally everybody. Uh, but ultimately, like we helped generate tens of thousands of leads uh, for our clients and for ourselves and um, scaled quite quickly and just kept duplicating what was working and keeping it simple. and learned a lot, did a lot wrong, did a lot right. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of the short version of the agency story. And then ultimately, ultimately a client of ours um, offered to buy it. And uh, I said, yeah. Happy little payday. So what did you decide to do out of interest once you, once you sold, like did you take some time off or? Yeah. So sold it in September of 2019 and uh, basically took about eight months to kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And um, that kind of segued into the difference that made the difference to me was um, essentially in between 2015 and 2017, I started working with a guy who... um, and let me back up just a little bit. Back starting in like 2010, I 
in so many words was like at a lowest point of low points and was it really caused me to uh, one of two things i was either going to end it and leave this planet or i was going to figure out how to get out of my slump and i knew it had to do with my mind in some way shape or form and so i studied just about everything there i think is to study in terms of religions philosophies techniques gurus you name it um i've bought the ticket attended the seminar read the book went through the training and um after kind of being really frustrated with a bunch of mainstream techniques and stuff that is probably it's pretty commonplace um i was introduced to a guy who introduced me to a guy who shared with me why all that shit wasn't working for me and it wasn't i was still just a new a new flavor of miserable and fucked up and just nothing in business or sales like i knew i had to be in business and or sales to you know i just i was just gravitated towards that but just, i sucked i wasn't making any money and it was a joke um, and so I met a guy who introduced me to a guy who shared with me why all the stuff that I was doing and learning from all the mainstream stuff wasn't working and uh, ended up moving to California to work with this dude. And uh, coming out of that, I and I worked with him very intensively, like four days a week for two and a half years on essentially once I saw that you could actually get rid of the mind shit, so to speak, permanently. I was kind of hooked and I'm just kept looking for more blocks to remove. And it got to a point where I was like, holy shit, like I know I can do, I know I can kind of fulfill my potential, so to speak. And that's when I started the agency and literally scaled it to multiple seven figures and sold it in 18 months. So what did I take time off? Yes, I took time off because I'd never really shared that and what I went through with anybody outside of just myself. And so um, what I'm doing now is essentially I've taken everything that I went through that worked to get out of my own way and be able to actually execute on the things that I knew I wanted to execute on. I've put it in a, I think, a much simpler and faster, efficient version of that. And that is what is now the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Program. So that is essentially... All we do in the Bulletproof Entrepreneur has nothing to do with how-tos in terms of how to build a business. I don't teach how to build an agency anymore. I don't teach any how-to business strategies or tactics. All we do is systematically remove mental blocks. And interestingly, we're 120 days into round one, essentially, of having about 70 enrollments so far. Between day one and day 60, just by removing mental blocks, we have our entrepreneurs an average of 78% increase in income. Wow. So, and we track all of those statistics. So I know it works. Um, and essentially I took this eight, nine months off after I sold the agency. Cause I was like, I don't want to be in the how to space. I don't want to have to keep up with Facebook and LinkedIn changes and shit. I just don't care. I'm sick of answering platform questions and this is really what I would be doing if I was like a multi-billionaire. I would be helping people get out of their own way and become the best versions of themselves. And I just so happen to know that the biggest opportunity and having the biggest effect that I want to have is doing that with entrepreneurs. Helps them have the largest effect on their teams, their families, their clients, and my ripple effect helping more people you know, I, I know that's where I can have the biggest impact. So decided to kind of put that in a consumable format for people that doesn't require working four days a week, one-on-one -on -one for two and a half years with somebody to actually have results. And um, so that was pretty much the story. Took some time off and then started cooking this up. And now this is what I do. I love it, man. And you know, that's such a refreshing message in the the kind of furore of online how to's and e courses on you know technical technicalities which as you kind of touched on there get hoovered up from from one day to the next and they're constantly changing when in reality i think what people are really capable of figuring out how the technicalities of how to do something is the tiniest part right but it's made out it's more yeah. to be like you need this strategy and you need to spend this amount of time actually figuring it out but in reality, the, the the nuts and bolts of why they're not actually moving forward and what it is that's really subconsciously preventing them from do so doing so is the real key to the game, right? Yep. 
Exactly. So the good news for us and the good news for me anyway, is somehow I was lucky enough to be introduced to stuff that actually works very, very well uh, to do this and help. On, there's so many entrepreneurs that bought the how-to program. And even it's not even the buying of it. It's all of it's free now on YouTube. Like every business strategy or tactic you could possibly need to know about how to run ads, hire, delegate, all that. Sh- it's all free. So lack of how-to information is not the problem. It's usually a, I'm afraid to fail. I doubt my own abilities. I don't believe in myself. I have resentments on past people who told me that this thing was going to work, but it didn't. And I know I should move forward, uh, but I can't because of these reasons. And I procrastinate and I have imposter syndrome and I need more focus and I have shiny object syndrome and all that shit. That's all basically the thing that keeps people from actually building the business has nothing to do with what the how-to is. The how-tos are quite simple. Yeah. And the majority of some people don't even realize the blocks there, right? Yeah. 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 So what can you kind of talk through? Because I've come across, you know, loads of different proposed strategies for for overcoming this, uh, this kind of stuff, ranging everything from meditation to hypnosis to just generally sitting down with a pattern pattern pad and paper and figuring stuff out, you know, generally. So can you kind of give us the broad overview of how the, the, the bulletproof system works? Yeah, essentially there's a couple of premises that it's it a couple assumptions that it makes. So everything that I'm about to share is just to make it a practical, workable thing that you can do. Not to say, so anybody listening and you personally, like this isn't, I'm declaring this truth or doctrine. It's meant to introduce a practical, workable thing to understand and do. Um, And I'll just give the high level understanding of it because I would be doing a disservice to say that I could answer the whole goddamn thing in eight minutes or whatever, you know. So essentially, it assumes that you are already naturally, and then I, when I do presentations, I ask people like, you already know that you have the next level in you yet, yeah, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. I know I've got it in me already. All right. So what's keeping you from getting it out? So it assumes that you are already the genius, focused, confident, powerful being. And it also assumes that the way the mind is structured is the mind is a collection of mental image pictures that all have an energy or a charge connected to them. And a charge essentially kind of think of it like a battery. So something bad happened to you yesterday. You'd go, man, I fucking got hit by a car that hurt and it was bad. So the imbalance, the memory in your mind, that picture of that event that happened has more negatives associated with it than positives associated with it. You with me so far, Dave? Yeah, with you. All right, cool. So all of those things going all the way back to the beginning of time, our mind is recording these memories of these little snippets of events that either have a positive charge, meaning that was really great and the positives outweighed the negatives, or a negative charge, meaning that really sucked and the negatives outweighed the positives. And all of those are what holds this thing that's called your mind together. So when you go call up that car accident yesterday, who is the one deciding to call it up and look at that mental image picture? It's you. It's not your body. It's not your mind. It's you. So you have a body, you have a mind, and you are the one who decides to call up that mind picture or make your arm move if it's your body. Who is the one? It's you. So you aren't a body. You are you. You have a body. You have a mind. When you say, when you identify as my elbow, my brain, my nose, you say my, you don't say I'm elbow, I'm brain, I'm nose. You say mine, who's yours. So that you is the thing that we're trying to get more out of the thing that is the beingness, the consciousness that controls all this shit. You with me so far? Sure, cool. So what happens is, is we have all these imbalanced past experiences, both positive and negative, that essentially the way I explain it holds on like you, let's say you got hit by a car yesterday. And if I say, hey, let's go play in the road today, you're going to be like, fuck that noise. I'm not playing in the road today because it's going to be scary. And I might get hit by another car because that just recently happened and it's stored in the mind that way, right? So you're projecting the past event 
that's negative into the future. And you're looking at the future through this lens of it, this bad thing is going to happen again. Right. And so it essentially, and that's not necessarily true. For example, if you get, uh, let's say there's a girl, she gets bit by a dog, she's four years old and she just decides for the rest of her life that all dogs are horribly dangerous creatures. There could be this cute little fluffy fuzzy puppy that is just the most friendly thing in the world, but she's going to see it as dangerous, right? It's not true that it's dangerous. She's just going to see it that way. Why? It's because this lens, she puts on this lens and looks at it through this this dangerous lens. And so all of us as entrepreneurs, let's say, look at, oh, I got rejected in the past as a very simple, stupid example, it's more than just one simple business rejection. It can be a conversation you overheard your parents having while you were one and a half years old. And they said, I don't know if he's going to be good. And just all those types of things are all being recorded in your mind all the time. And you're associating is as good as is bad. And you're storing it that way. And when you see something in present time, or you project something happening in the future, you call up the relevant lens to filter it through. So I see a dog. I got bit by a dog. I'm going to put on my dog lens. My dog lens is imbalanced to the negative. And I'm going to see an untruth in the present time when staring at this fuzzy puppy, right? So these imbalances are what essentially cause all of these problems. So essentially what we do is just like a balanced equation in math class when, you know, like 4X equals 4X. Well, when each side is equal to each other, what happens? They cancel out and all that's left is zeros. So what we do essentially is go in, take an inventory of what are these imbalances, both positive and negative, and we balance them out. And once they're balanced out, the equation essentially cancels itself out and all that's left is you the conscious genius being that is able to just focus on a thing, apply a thing, do a thing without any skewed lenses. And I kind of use the analogy of, it's kind of like wearing drunk goggles. Everybody thinks they need a new car and they need a better steering wheel and they need better driving skill. And they're thinking that through the lens of they're all, they're already drunk. So I don't say you need another how to drive program. I just say, you're already a good driver. We just need to sober you up. And they go, whoa, you're right. How do I do that? So that's that's essentially the premise of what we do. Yeah, that's huge, man. That makes so much sense. So I'm really curious, like, first of all, how do you actually get people to start to identify these things? Like, are you like putting Mm -hmm. people through like a regressive progress? Uh, process because most people just ignore these things that don't exist, right? Or they suppress. Yeah. Them. So we have these tools that I've created based on a lot of different references that are kind of my versions of taking uh, taking you through these processes that are right now they're actually um, quite an elaborate system of Google Sheets that has a lot of automations connected with it with if then scenarios. But essentially, we have 10 different tools. There's an anger tool, resentment tool, frustration tool, fear and anxiety tool, self-doubt, feeling judged, guilt and shame, grief and loss, and depression and infatuation. I did all that by memory. Wow. So each one of those has its own anatomy of how it's imbalanced. So I won't get into the details of that right now, but essentially, we take an inventory of and we ask a number of questions in an onboarding process and on a call that we have with anybody who decides to, they want to get rid of all their shit. And we take a huge inventory of all the shit that is very consciously on their mind. And then we take an inventory of stuff that they might not have thought of to put on an onboarding form, let's say. And so we take a very, very thorough inventory of what are your specific imbalances and each one has its own way of essentially balancing it. And as we call it, discharging it. So just like if something has a negative energy or a positive energy, we make it to where it literally has no actual polarized energy and the thing fucking just disappears. And that's why it's kind of like one of those things where you ever get something off your chest and you feel lighter. Mm. 
Yeah. Right. So that's essentially what we're doing. It's not necessarily getting it off your chest, but that's a good analogy. Everybody's like, yeah, I've had that experience. So that's why I use it as, as an example. But essentially we're unsticking the stuck mind stuff. So when you get something off your chest, like you feel guilty and you say, oh, I did the stuff and you finally admit it. You were essentially balancing out. There was, it was, it was charged up to like, this is a bad thing that I can't share with anybody. And then you share it. In so many ways, you're saying this is an okay thing to share now, and that balances it out. And therefore, that energy that's that heavy weighted negative shit balances itself out. The equation cancels out and you feel lighter and it basically disappears. That's essentially what we're doing. But instead of doing it verbally, it's essentially you're kind of typing the answers into a very organized series of questions for each of these tools. And uh, we have a way of measuring all of that charge as well. And we've kind of gamified it in a way to where you can actually track your mental progress uh, using a dashboard. So you might have gone through some meditations and be like, I think I feel better. I don't know. We're making all of that measurable because in the research that I was doing for this, one of the biggest complaints about certain programs like this was I don't know if it's actually working and I can't tell. And that's a new self doubt that somebody has. And so we just, I wanted to put some reality to that. So you can actually see on paper, like, holy shit, like that actually did make a difference. Like I, there's literally no disputing it and it makes it easier for somebody to solidify in their mind, so to speak, that they're actually making progress, making gains. So think about it this way. Have you ever been dumped, Dave? Um, no, I don't think I have actually. Okay. Well, congratulations. Well done. So let's assume, let's assume for a second that somebody has been dumped. Yep. Usually when you ask somebody, have you been dumped? They say yes. And usually when you ask them, was that a good thing or a bad thing? They go, that was a bad thing. It sucked. It was painful and I hated it. Right. So usually when I do a presentation, I ask like, how many of you guys have been dumped? And they go like, oh yeah, I have. Cool. Was that good or bad? Thumbs up for good. Thumbs down for bad. I get a whole bunch of thumbs down. Right. And so I say, all right, cool. How many of you guys who have been dumped are now with somebody that you really enjoy being with? And they raise their hand. I say, so you went through this bad experience that has led you to this good scenario that you're calling it now. Was that an actually a bad experience? And they're like, huh, no. So at the time, your mind immediately, because it puts on the lens of like, oh, you get dumped, fuck that person, right? Now you're a bad person. I must suck. I feel guilty. And that all those lenses stack on to where all of the positives of it caused me to reevaluate who I was. It allowed, it allowed me to go out and play the field and have more freedom. Maybe I can now, I'm free to do whatever I want when I want and not have to worry about when somebody else is going to be home. Maybe I've been neglecting some friends and now I'm actually able to spend time with those friends again. All these positives start to emerge to this bad event. So what's interesting is at the time of that event occurring, you're not very aware of all of the positives, are you? Right? So interested, but are they not, it's not like they appeared later. They were always there, weren't they? Yeah. So there's a couple laws. There's the law of polarity and the law, or law of conservation of energy. Essentially what that means is everything is always balanced. Good, bad, positive, negative, hot, cold, up, down are all always there. They're all relative. What our minds do is, is assign a positive or a negative polarity to them and neglect to see the other side. So it's like being in a relationship that you're super infatuated with. Oh, there's, they're only perfect. They're super hot. They're super nice. And it's, everything's perfect. You don't see the other side that also exists. And then all of a sudden they do some fucky shit and they go crazy and you go, Oh man, I was blindsided by that. You were because you were blind to the other side. You didn't take into account there are equally as many negatives to this person as there are positives. And we do this in business. Oh, business is going to be easy. Starting your podcast is going to be this fucking awesome opportunity. And it's only going to be good, amazing things. And that's why you start it. And then I'm sure you've experienced some challenges in some way, shape or form building this, right? And you go, oh, fuck, I didn't think it was going to be that hard to figure out how to do this, that and the other. So you were only conscious of the positives when you started and then you found out there's all these negatives and you said, oh man, there wasn't supposed to be. And that's how people kind of go throughout life with all these imbalanced perceptions. So what happens is when you 
become aware that that's the case. There's never anything that's only positive or only negative. This is why when it gets back to like, you know, Warren, Beff Warren Buffett is very famous for saying, if you can't manage your emotions, you can't manage money. He doesn't get too up when he wins. He doesn't get too down when he loses. Most people who try to invest money invest when they're super, this is only going to win. Yay, we're only going to make a lot of money. And then they get super down and depressed and want to fucking kill themselves after they have a loss. And that's why they don't do well. Warren, even Q. Yeah. So when you have that balance like Warren has, interestingly, it does a lot for your ability to make better decisions, execute better, and all that good stuff. So what we do is essentially, if you're in your own way, you have imposter syndrome, you're doubting yourself, you're afraid of failure, you're afraid of rejection, you have all this shit. All of that is imbalanced perceptions that once balanced out, you realize, holy shit, all of that was basically just how I was looking at it. But it, you, you basically see it in a way to where you can't unsee it if done thoroughly and properly. And that's what we do very systematically. We hammer each of those out kind of one by one. And over a long enough period of time, when there's a lot of them and they're all intertwined in your mind, kind of like a web where one leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. The good news is, is there's a way to be very thorough in getting rid of all of them. And there's a lot, but uh, all I can say is it's work worth doing because who do you take with you wherever you go? You. So, yeah. so you better be able to look at shit in a way that's actually supportive. So that's essentially the premise of everything that uh, we do. I love it, man. You know, this concept of lenses as well is is really great because, you know, it's clear that the perception of any given situation, first of all, can change dramatically, even with like a shift in physiological state. So with a bit of sleep, when you, you always have a bit, a bit of time to to you know dust things off and, and take a look at things a bit more logically and, or even after the gym as well when you've got some endorphins pumping yeah. around your brain like suddenly you take a look at the exact same situation and it's it's you've got a completely different lens i guess a completely different set of situations so yeah it kind of sounds like a uh it's based in kind of stoicism you know that kind of that attempt to stay at a neutral kind of level is does that kind of build into it and can you give us a bit more backstory on the guy that talks to you yeah essentially there's um it, that's one of the very many sources that I've studied and pulled from. And just the, the principles of stoicism, it's not like that's the only place in any philosophy that they show up. So universal truths are universal truths. They're explained in the Bible in they're explained all in different ways and different with different words. But essentially, they're, all of them are saying essentially the same things. And so what I've done is like a universal truth is universal truth. It's not just a way of looking at it that kind of works. It's just like once you see that something's true, it's not it's not my opinion. It's just it's a, it's a truth. So yes, yeah, some of those truths are explained in so in Stoicism, and they're also explained in very many other philosophies, religions, viewpoints, um, you name it. But yes, that is one of the very many places that these truths show up. Yeah, got it. So I'm curious as well. Like, are you able to? give like a broad overview of like business owners, entrepreneurs, what commonly shows up, like what sorts of things are, are holding people back, what sorts of beliefs? Yeah, I mean, in, in their words, I mean, I, I literally have the inventory of it that I kind of was listed. The biggest one is fear of failure, right? I'm afraid of failing, letting my family down, going broke, not having an income. I doubt my ability to do this thing. I feel judged for my content. I feel judged for how I sound. I feel judged for not being prepared enough. I have resentments against people that I've hired to do a thing and it didn't work out. Um, my family resents me for going off and doing this entrepreneurship thing and they think I'm an idiot, but I want to prove them wrong. And there's like all of those it's, you know, it's, it's also explained as imposter syndrome and shiny object syndrome. And like, there's very basic kind of bundles that people have put, uh, these perceptions into it are like, Oh, I, I lack focus. I have ADD. I, you know, whatever it is, um, like that, that's kind of the basics of what, people come to us with uh one of the questions that we ask everybody is well, if you could change one thing about your mindset what would you change and usually that oh man i wish i could only be more focused 
So from there, for example, the focus example, it's not that we train you on how to focus. You already know how to fucking focus. The problem is you're drunk. So we sober you up and you go, holy shit, my focus increased. I literally have zero lessons on what I teach on how to focus on shit. And we also focus is one of the things that we measure in terms of like, we just do a scale of one to 10. How would you rate your focus? Like a very simple thing. We do it on day one, day 30, 60, 90, and so on. Focus increase is somewhere. I don't have it right in front of me, in front of me but it's like people rating themselves a 68% increase in focus on average across the board, just by essentially balancing out the bullshit in the mind. So it's not, you naturally in your natural state are pretty goddamn good at focusing. So you don't have a focus problem. You think you do. Good news is once we explain that to people and share with them how to essentially get rid of the unfocused lens, magically all that's left is focus. So that imposter syndrome has its own anatomy. All of these other things are essentially caused by some combination of certain lenses that are kind of jammed together that uh, we've gotten pretty solid at tearing them apart. And um, all that's left is the able you. That's cool as hell, man. Hey, you know, something we just uh, we touched on just a second ago about um, physiological state and how you perceive things differently when you've been to the gym, done some exercise, et cetera. How much does that play into your, uh, to your practices? And do you think that that, in a sense, like when you do get that increase in focus, increase in productivity, increase in all the good things due to some exercise, do you think that's kind of like, a bit of a, well, not really addressing the real, real issue? Uh, correct. I think that, um, and I don't, we don't necessarily have time to unpack that whole entire thing, but essentially anything, let me put it this way. And I say this a lot because people also like, oh, I wish I could be more consistent and diligent, for example. And I feel better when I go to the gym, but when I forget or don't or run out of time or whatever, I self-sabotage and whatever everybody falls off the horse. Everybody. I don't care how high a performer you are. Maybe minus one or two anomalies, but even so, it's impossible to be perfectly consistent. It's technically impossible. Even the guy who I wake up at 4.30 every morning and do this, that, and the other. That's cool, but I bet there's some mornings where you wake up at 4.29 and other mornings where you wake up at 4.33. You want to talk about perfect consistency? You're not perfectly consistent either. So you have these people that have, uh, and a lot of us have the infatuation with, I want to be perfectly consistent and I need to get my body into this thing to, in order to have this experience. That's cool. But also I, my mission is to create free entrepreneurs, not new things to be slaves to. So if you need to be a slave to, I need to go to the gym every goddamn day to do this thing and you feel like a piece of a guilty piece of shit if you don't like you can mode that's how they that's by the way how they get cows to go in a direction they prod them in the ass with a cattle prod and they dangle some food in front of them so you can very much be successful as an entrepreneur by doing installing a whole bunch of pleasure with being rich and a whole bunch of pain with being poor but you're not a cow I don't think so. Anyway, I don't think anybody listening to this is a cow. So that being said, do you want to motivate yourself like a cow? And if you don't, for example, show up that day, you feel guilty. Now you have a new guilt charge, an imbalanced thing of, oh, I proved myself. I suck. And now you have a new lens that you've stored and with a negative charge, essentially. And now people think that's just basically like, let's assume for argument's sake, Alcohol is a downer, cocaine is an upper, right? What most people do is they go, oh, I I know that naturally I drink too much alcohol as a metaphor and I'm down, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down. So what they do is I need to do these physiological things in order to get up because I can't get up alone. I need my body to do it. So they start installing physiological things, i.e. taking cocaine to try and balance out the downer. Now you can experience a shift if you're drunk and you take some cocaine, but a lot of people are trying to find that middle balance by balancing out a perfect concoction of alcohol and cocaine. That's not the most sustainable solution. 
So what I'm saying is let's get rid of the alcohol and the, the need for alcohol and the need for cocaine altogether. And all that's left is a pretty able you. And the sin is not like, let's say you don't go to the gym. You feel a little guilty about it. That guilt is a new negative. Fine. Most people, a lot of people let that little miss let them remind themselves, oh, I guess I can't do this. I guess I can't be consistent. Now all that shit runs. And people derail themselves sometimes for days, weeks, months, or even years based on just feeling guilty for missing the fucking gym session. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I miss shit constantly. So does everybody else. Even the guy who claims he doesn't misses shit. The difference is the sin isn't missing things. The sin isn't even feeling guilty about it. The sin is sitting in it for an extended period of time. So the, the quicker that you can balance out those perceptions in the mind, the easier it is for you to just get back on the goddamn horse. So I'm not, I'm not of the opinion that I need to jump up and down, yell at myself in the mirror every fucking day. That's just installing more cocaine, essentially. Yeah. That's huge, man. It's, it's, such, it's such a refreshing um, message, you know, and such a such a kind of a unique take on it as well. It's just the kind of okay, stop. Like, let's just take a a, a real kind of inventory, as you said, of the situation, and, and take things back to first principles. Right? It's something that you don't really hear that much about in the marketplace, especially today. Yeah, yeah, and it's why, like, so being coming from a guy who spent years doing the whole write my goals on my mirror and yell them at myself every fucking day, jump up and down, make my move, and fucking go and do the traditional, like, here's how you motivate yourself stuff. I don't know. I, I thought I stuck with it for long enough, eight goddamn years of doing that. It still wasn't doing it for me. In fact, I knew there was a part of me and I find this is a common thing too. A lot of people that do this to themselves. Now, if, by the way, again, if it works for you or works for anybody listening, like keep doing it. That's cool. I'm not here to say stop. What I'm here to say is for me, all I can share with you is what works for me, what works for my students is a common theme has been, you know, I did all this affirmation shit and really got my body going and all of the physiology stuff. But I always felt like there was a part of me that was just kind of lying to myself and like manufacturing this shit. And I always kind of knew in the back of my mind that there was something that just didn't feel right about this. And so it's kind of like, you know, let's say you have an old rotting barn. What a lot of that I've found does, or at least this is how I've learned to think about it in a way that works for me, is a lot of people have an old rotting barn, but they think and they're taught that the only way to make it better is to go, instead of actually removing the rot, we're just going to go get some nice thick new paint and just start painting a new coat of paint over that old rotting barn. Looks great on the outside. You could probably even explain it to somebody as to how good it looks, but you know that the shit's rotting underneath. And there's that part of everybody that I've worked with that is just like, yeah, I just like lying to myself in the mirror doesn't feel like the right move. And I realized that there'd be a lot of, I'm, I'm, this is an oversimplification. And again, there is something to be said for some of that if done in a way that is 100% authentic. Uh, but the whole fake it till you make it thing, like for me, yes, you can get results. For me, it's not how I want to live with myself. I've gotten more sales by going, hey, I'm new and I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but I'm willing to work my ass off for you. I've gotten more sales and better client relationships doing that than saying, I've got all my shit together. I have all the answers. I'm going to crush it for you. Yeah, so probably you, with the right, right kind of people as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, again, take all of this with a grain of salt. And I'm oversimplifying a lot of this to make a point. Um, to just illustrate how we do shit and why some of those conclusions were come to not to shit on anybody or anybody else's philosophy. That's not my point. Again, if it works for you, keep fucking doing it by all means. If it doesn't, great. My entire mission is to help people empower themselves with their own knowingness and decision-making ability to know what works for them is okay. 
Yeah. Like for example, I don't wake up at four fucking 30, made millions of dollars. You see Instagram posts constantly about the only way to be a millionaire is wake up at four 30, exercise, jump up and down, do the green drink, do your affirmations, spend, you know, whatever this time reading and like all this shit. I don't do any of that. I don't really turn on until like 10 30 in the morning. I know I've learned that about myself. I used to feel guilty about it and used to feel like I was going to be a failure because of that. Now it's a strength and I know exactly what my personal success formula is. And I'm confident enough in trusting myself to know what works for me. Too many people I feel are throwing out or not trusting what works for them because they were told to go find a mentor and do exactly what the fuck the mentor does and you get the exact same fucking results. There's something to be said for that, but also all of those are tools in your tool belt. As they say, wisdom, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to use it in a fruit salad. So you're getting a lot of stuff fed to you on social media, especially if you're listening to this podcast, most likely you're on social media as well. You're getting a lot of shit fed to you that are all tools in her tool belt. But just because somebody hands you a screwdriver doesn't mean that that's the right tool to use right now. So a real craftsman knows what tool to use and when. There's a time and a place to be all motivated and jacked up and shit. There's a time and a place not to be. Anybody who says you need to always be in a perfect peak, this, that, and the other, I know what they're saying, but also that gets taken a bit too literally and a bit out of context. It's a tool in a tool belt. If you're, if I come on a call with you and you're asking for my help and you're all kind of down and depressed and I come to the call going, Hey man, how's it going? I'm going to break rapport fucking immediately. I can't help you from that place. Right? So I have to use going down to the depressed slower level because you're depressed and slow as a tool. And I have to, have the acumen to know that that's the tool to use right now. Too many people just say, ah, I have one tool, I have a hammer, and I'm going to use the hammer to do everything. Yeah. And a really, and a really poor law of ratio means that it might just work out just enough to start making some profit. Right? <laughs> I, I absolutely love everything you're talking about, man. I think I, I can see how powerful it is, and you know, I hope everybody listening can too. Um, it's incredible stuff, just like the fundamental basics of fix your mind, and then everything else gets easier, right? Where can people find out more about the, the Bulletproof program? How can people get involved? Yeah, so if right now, if you just go to, there's two places. We actually have a whole shitload of free content where I expand on this further. If you just go on Facebook and search for the Seven Figure Mindset Secrets Facebook group, um, you can also go to whitingsolutions.com. And that'll probably lead you into that Facebook, Facebook group as well, because that's all where all the goods are. Um, but yeah, there's literally like probably 25 hours of free training in that group. So go to that group. That's amazing. Yeah. We'll make sure the links for that are in and around this podcast. So John, thanks again for, uh, for your time. I like genuinely awesome insight that you provided there. So really appreciate that. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. This has been the Viral by Design podcast with Dave Rothero. For more viral marketing secrets and to get detailed cliff notes on all episodes, visit viralbydesign.net.